Bill Lee knows about this very well, and we're so pleased to get him uh, to weigh in on this. He's chief economist at the Milken Institute with years of experience watching Chinese markets and understanding the psychology behind them. Bill, what do you make of that? Do you think that the uh, what we've seen so far with respect to stimulus is just the tip of the iceberg from the PBOC? Oh, China is suffering from the, the four Ds, right? Lack of demand, uh, the de-risking that the U.S. And, and, and China are involved in, bad demographics, and heavy debt. So they really have a lot to, of headwinds to deal with. And right now, the, the management of the economy, the Central Economic Work Conference that just took place, uh, they're pulling out the old solutions, which is we're going to bolster the supply side. We're going to try to make our industries modern. We're trying to shift our, our resources to try to bolster the supply side of the manufacturing sector. That is the, not the solution that they need to, to support the economy because the real problem, at least in the short run, is deficient demand. There's no one willing to consume. And I think the fiscal policy on the part of the Chinese is one where they just have an aversion toward putting support into the household, and into the private sector. And instead, they want to shift uh, emphasis onto the public sector. And that's one of the China's key problems. Bill, as U.S. election season ramps up, you know, we've basically, many are expecting China-U.S. trade rhetoric to kind of pick up again. You know, I mean, obviously, it's one of those few topics that both parties agree upon. You know, do you see this as a risk? Do you see, you know, markets beginning to price in an increase in uh, U.S. tariffs on China in the coming year? I think one of the things that is going to come out of uh, the election uh, uh, campaign is that everyone will agree that we need to de-risk from China. And, and I think one of the, the results we already see is a diversion of capital flows away from China to the rest of Asia. And, and unfortunately, the Chinese don't seem to recognize the seriousness of this because President Xi and, has not addressed anything past the, the speech he gave in San Francisco about how China is open and welcomes foreign investors. But they've done nothing to reduce the Espionage Act and all of the measures they put in place to make it difficult for foreign investors to get into China. So so it, this, this heated debate that's going to be uh, amplified Amplified by the election is going to make the tensions even worse, and that's why uh, Secretary Yellen is really going ahead of the the, uh, the wave of uh, and, and trying to get a charm offensive going on both sides, both from the Chinese and also from our side. Bill, when the uh, China-U.S. trade war first started, there was a lot of talk from multinationals about how they can't afford to pull out of China, the insatiable demand that was coming out of China. Yet, fast forward a few years, and here we are, and the cost of doing business in China has gone up considerably. What are multinationals saying? Do they want to continue to do business in China? Well, actually, it's split. Um, the people who are already in China are the ones that are applauding President Xi's speech, and they're saying we are devoted to China. We're going to be staying in China because China is our is our market. But if you ask the real question, where are you putting a marginal dollar? More often than not, you're going to hear, "I need to diversify my supply chains. I need to de-risk. I need to find places that are cheaper for my uh, my my manufacturing." And that's often ASEAN and other parts of Asia. So, so the the the, the policies that China has put in place have really not done themselves well in terms of keeping investors there and attracting more money. Well, let's talk about investors there. You know, you mentioned the multinational perspective, but when you think about confidence on the part of yeah. investors, is it there and how do you restore it? China was thought of as the great market where all I have to do is sell one item of my, well, no, all I do is sell one Coke and I'm gonna make a fortune because there are so many people there. I think one of the things that, that people are realizing is that while there's a huge population, it's a population that currently is not willing to spend because they don't have the confidence in their income being secure and they don't have the wealth being secure because of the property market. And right now, without a, a public safety net as one of the supports that China can offer their people, people are just saving a lot of their money. And I think the uh, American investors and Western investors are realizing that it's not a safe market, at least in the near term, until China is able to put in some safety nets that will assure the Chinese consumer that their income is secure and their, their, their wealth is secure. Did Fed Chair Powell kind of give a lifeline to both China and the rest of the world, given the fact that there is a massive shift in tone this week? Oh, absolutely. And, and uh, you know, when I was at the Fed, one of the things that we worried about was whether the transmission of monetary policy was effective or not. And we paid, we looked at the real interest rate. And right now, if you look at the belly of the curve, which you're fond of, of the mentioning, uh, the most liquid part of the curve, um, you see that the real rates there adjusted for inflation somewhere over 2%. That meant that we were drawing in quite a lot of uh, capital from the rest of the world. But Chair Powell, by saying that we're going to be targeting that real rate and reducing it, uh, lowering uh, the, the Fed funds rate, 
I hope by the same pace as inflation is going down and maybe a little bit faster, that will reduce the real rate differential between us and the rest of the world. And that will stem some of the outflow that's coming out of China. Right now, we've seen some of the biggest two-day declines in uh, real rates that we've seen going back to the height of the pandemic. Right now, five-year uh, real rates, 1.69% down yeah. from a high in early October of 2.6%. I mean, just really shocking moves. Bill, do you think that this is overdone, though, given the fact that we're getting stronger than expected data and that yesterday's retail sales came in stronger? I mean, is there consistent to you to see a strong economy and ongoing disinflation, uh, you know, regardless of the fact that we have a fully employed America? We've always counted on markets overreacting. I mean, this is another example of markets overreacting. And Chair Paul put the rate cuts on the table because he wanted the markets to start to lower these long-term real interest rates. Uh, and, and, and it gives him time to slowly adjust the Fed funds rate, probably wait until the spring or summer before actually starting the implementation of the stuff, of, of, the, of the rate cuts. And that way, I think he can smoothly navigate that real rate down. Now, if something goes wrong, he has the option to be able to raise rates to, uh, to offer set any kind of upward blip in, in inflation or, or, or go down even further if the economy actually were to go south. Billy of the Milken Institute, thank you so much for being with us. I've got to say the volatility that we've seen over the past week, over the past year, has been shocking. And you do wonder, Katie, what the consequence is of these sort of whipsaw moves in full faith and credit, the sort of benchmark rate for all other instruments.